Uh, sometimes I like to start off with a joke. Did you hear about the man who got in an accident and the entire left side of his body was cut off in the accident? Oh, he turned out all right. Well, in this passage, Jesus isn't talking about half of his body being cut off, but he is talking about his body. And Jesus says very clearly uh, this very evocative imagery of his body and his blood. Let's see what he says in this passage. Jesus says, my flesh is true food and my blood is the true drink. Instead of the word body, he's using the word flesh here. My flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you are one with me and I am one with you. Now, this is uh, following on the heels of what we talked about last week and the week before. We were talking about Jesus as the bread of life, the bread from heaven. And now he's um, taking this idea of bread and he's introducing his idea of, of body and flesh. And when we hear the phrase body and blood or flesh and blood, there's something that we're probably thinking of when we are in a church setting and we hear the phrase body and blood. What, what's that? That kind of jumps to your head. Yeah, the Eucharist, the communion, right? Here's a picture to remind us. We hear body and blood, we think bread and wine, because indeed, that's, that's what we say. Uh, Jesus Christ you know, told the disciples, this is my body, this is my blood. And so when we hear this passage from John, we start thinking Eucharist, we start thinking communion. And, and that's very uh, proper that we do so. It leads us, though, to start asking questions about what is this Eucharist? What is this communion? And in our church, we call it a sacrament, right? It is a sacrament, just like baptism. Baptism and Eucharist are the two most important sacraments. And maybe this is a good opportunity to ask ourselves, what is a sacrament? Here we have Jesus introducing the sacrament of communion, introducing the sacrament of Eucharist by talking about his body and blood. And we know that in, in this church, in the Episcopal Church, baptism and Eucharist are the two central sacraments. Maybe it's time to go ahead and ask, what is a sacrament? And then, if we're done asking that, we could say, why do we need sacraments? And then, finally, we might even ask, why do we need the presence of God? So that's the journey that I'm on today. Are you with me for this? Yes. All right, let's take a look. Number one, what is a sacrament? I've got a definition for you. You may have heard a definition of a sacrament before, an outward and visible sign of a spiritual and inward grace. That's way too hard for me, so I've made it a little bit easier. A sacrament is an action through which God's presence is made real for us. A sacrament is an action through which God's presence is made real for us. That's interesting. Why would we need God's presence to be made real for us? Don't we already know that God is present? Don't we already know that God is with us? Why would we need a sacrament to make it real for us? You know what? I've got an example. I've got a demonstration to help us figure this out. Some of you may have been wondering why there's a briefcase up here. I'm going to need a volunteer. I'm going to need a volunteer. How about all the way in the back? Yeah, you're going to come on up. Talking about the idea of something being made real for us. Can you tell everyone your name? Sophia. Okay, Sophia, would you face everyone? Sophia, I just found out that you won a million dollars. Yes. Everybody clap for Sophia. She has won a million dollars. Yeah. Okay, does that feel real to you that I just told you you won a million dollars? Uh, no. Yeah, uh, no. Okay, how can I make this feel more real for you? What if I gave you a check, a certified cashier's check for one million dollars? What if I gave that to you? Does it make, make it start feeling more real to you if you got to hold this check in your hand? Yes. Starts feeling a little bit more real? Yes. But I bet it doesn't totally feel real right now to you that you just won a million dollars. What could I do to make it feel even more real for you? Could you hold this for a minute? Could I make this feel really real for you? <laughs> Sophia, is this starting to feel real for you? That you just won a million dollars? Yes. 
Now, what if I put this in your hand? Would that start to feel really real for you, that you yes. just won a million dollars? Yes. Ah, okay. So when I told you that you had won a million dollars, it was kind of like, uh, it was just words, right? Yeah. But then when I opened that briefcase, it started to become like a real thing. Can everybody give Sophia a round of applause? And unfortunately, I do need you to put that back in the briefcase. Thank you. What, what an amazing thing. It, she heard it, and she, she maybe knew it up here, but then all of a sudden, the case opened, and this idea of winning the million dollars, it became real. She could actually reach out and touch it. Well, this is what we're talking about when we talk about sacraments, when we talk about baptism, when we talk about Eucharist. We're talking about taking these things that we know about God. Okay, we know that God is with us. We know that God is present with us. When we see a child baptized, we know that God loves that child and has claimed that child. But when the, when the water is poured, it becomes real. When the, the bread and the wine is offered, it becomes real. And in the case of Eucharist, it's something that you can actually reach out and touch and taste. And so this, this theology that we have in our heads about God loving us and God being present with us through a sacrament becomes an opportunity for us to actually reach out, take it, feel it, touch it, and taste it. And, and experience the presence of God as a reality. That's what sacraments are all about. Um, the next you know, thing on our, on our journey is to ask the question, why do we need sacraments? Why do we need sacraments? Um, somebody might say, I don't need a sacrament for the presence of God to be made real to me. I can experience the realness of God's presence in any number of ways, and I certainly don't need church or a priest or a sacrament to tell me how to experience God's presence. I think that's a fair statement. Um, for example, on my next slide, I've got a picture of somebody taking a walk on the beach, and somebody might say, I experiencing you know, God's real presence when I take a walk on the beach. I'm on my own, I see the sunrise, and that's when God is real for me. I don't need um, bread and wine, or I don't need the waters of baptism to make God feel real to me. I've got the realness of God right there. It's a fair point, but I would like to make three points about sacraments. Um, not to say that they're better or worse than taking a walk on the beach, but let me make three points about sacraments that um, perhaps raise it to a different level. On my next slide, I want to say that sacraments first of all, are experienced in community. Okay, taking a walk on the beach on your own um, can be a powerful experience, but if you're just on your own, you don't have the benefit of community around you. And Eucharist, what's so neat about it is it's always done in community, isn't it? Uh, even if you're taking communion just with one other person, like for example, I'm gonna be going to take communion to somebody named Elaine right after this service. Um, it'll be that just the two of us but I will be representing all of you, and the two of us will be sharing community, will be sh you know, joining in the community of God's people. And so sacraments, uh, unlike a walk on the beach, are always experienced in community, and there's power to that. The second point I want to make about sacraments is that they were instituted by Jesus. You know, in this very passage, Jesus says, whoever drinks my blood and eats of my flesh, I will be in them and they will be in me. And of course, it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that Jesus is at the Last Supper, and he says, do this in remembrance of me. So the Eucharist especially is something which Jesus asked us to do. Jesus commanded us to do in remembrance of him. Nothing against walks on the beach, but Jesus never said, go and take a walk on the beach in remembrance of me. But he did say, break the bread and share the wine in remembrance of me. There's a writer named uh, Gregory Dix who talked about this idea, and he said, at the heart of Christian worship is the Eucharistic action, the communion, taking, blessing, breaking, and giving of bread, and giving of the cup of wine. This was first done and given their new meaning by a young Jew at supper with his friends on the night before he died. Henceforth, with this new meaning, he asked that we do it ever since. 
Was ever another command so obeyed? For century after century, spreading slowly to every continent and country and among every race on earth, this same action of bread and wine has been done in every conceivable human circumstance for every conceivable human need from infancy before to extreme old age. Week by week, month by month, and a hundred thousand successive Sundays, faithfully, unfailingly, across all the parishes of Christendom, the pastors have done this simple action, the Holy Communion of the people of God. Jesus asked that we do it, and was ever command ever so obeyed? It's been done for hundreds of years ever since. Which leads me to my last point about sacraments, which is to say that they've been repeated across time and space. Isn't it amazing sometimes when you watch somebody get baptized or when you take the bread and the wine that you know at that very moment there are thousands of people around the world doing the exact same thing. And those thousands of people have been doing that exact same thing for 2,000 years. To experience God's love and God's presence as something real and to know that Christians have done the same thing and are doing the same thing across the entire globe, across two millennia. This is part of the reason why our church is so, um, so strong in the sacraments. Have uh, the third question, which is, why do we need God's presence? That's kind of the, an even larger question. So we started by saying, what is a sacrament? And then we said, well, why do we even need sacraments? And we said, well, sacraments are helping us feel God's presence. And the question is, well, why do I even need God's presence? Am I, am I going to die if I don't have God's presence? Am I going to be cut off from God if I don't have God's presence? Um, here's what I want to say about needing God's presence. We need God's presence because we've been picked for God's team. We've all been chosen to be on God's team, and we need God's presence to sustain us and feed us for the work that we have to do on God's team. That work is changing the world by becoming more and more like Jesus. And we've been picked for that work. We've been chosen for God's team. I've been thinking a lot about team choosing lately because football season is coming up and I play this silly game called fantasy football. Is there anybody else out there that plays this silly game called fantasy football? All right, we've got a few. Uh, some people play it for money. I don't like to play it for money, but I get very into it. And what it is, is you have all these football players, and you get to choose which ones you like best. And if they do well on any given Sunday, then you get points for your fantasy team. It sounds simple. I guess it is simple, but we make it very complex, and we have lots of fun choosing the players that we want on our team. We spend all this time thinking about who's my first pick going to be. When I have my first pick, am I going to take Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers? What's my first pick going to be? Who am I going to choose for my team? Because once I've chosen that person for my team, I'm going to watch that person, and I'm going to care about that person and hope nothing bad happens to that person and hope that person does really, really well. Well, I realized that you have been chosen to be on God's team. You are the number one draft pick. You are the first round draft pick on God's team. God's change the world by becoming more and more like Jesus Christ reality team. And you're the number one pick. You're so important to God that if you were the only person that had ever existed, Jesus Christ still would have come to you and claimed you as his own and offered his body and blood just for you. You are the first round draft pick on God's reality team. So it's always, you know, kind of interesting when I, when I talk to somebody on the phone and maybe I'm, I'm going to be visiting somebody or spending some time with them talking on the phone or bringing them communion, and they say, oh, well, you know, I know you're really busy and I know I'm not all that important and you've got a lot of other things to do. And I want to stop and say, wait a minute, you're a first-round draft pick. There is nobody more valuable than you. And, and of course, of course my time with you is crucial because you are a first-round draft pick on God's team. What an amazing way to think about it, to think that God has chosen us for the work of God's kingdom, God's work of changing the world, God's work of becoming more and more like Jesus so that we can change our lives, we can change our families, we can transform our communities, 
We can transform our country. We can transform the world. And we've been picked to be on that team. So, of course we need God's presence. That presence is going to feed and sustain us for the work of being on God's transformative team. And of course we need the sacraments, because in the sacraments, it's an opportunity to have that presence, have that love, be a living, breathing reality. That, in the case of the Eucharist, you can actually reach out, touch, taste, and see. It all comes full circle, doesn't it? Because when we think about when God was most present in the world, it was when Jesus was here. The most present God has ever been was through and in the person and life of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' body was the presence of God. And then, wonder of wonders, Jesus says to us, I give you my body. And wonder of wonders, every Sunday we reach out, touch, taste, and experience the reality of Jesus' body, and in so doing, experience the reality of God's presence. It's going to help us change our lives. It's going to help us change the world. And it all starts with Jesus saying, my flesh is the true food and my blood is the true drink. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you are one with me and I am one with you. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.